branding is not about the Don Draper blocking some creative person in a room and like squeezing a, an idea out of them. You could do that before, but then the internet came around. You don't get to just say something anymore, right? There's people who are going to question it and validate or invalidate what you say. So now it's about strategic brand development. It's like, well, hold, all right, fine. I'm not going to just talk as a business. I'm not going to just market myself. I'm going to ask myself, all right, well, who are the audiences that I'm trying to market to? And what competitive institutions are also trying to talk to them? You know, just like a deductive analysis so you don't look or sound like the organizations trying to compete for your audience's mind share, right? Well, that's strategic brand development. Like you might have strategic technology investment in your business. You put a plan together. You source the best ingredients and you frame it and teach your employees how to use it. That same mechanical practice works in the branding business. In fact, it works in personal branding. More specifically, with you as a career pivoter, as a business owner, as the leader of your family, whatever the case, Communication is key to anyone's understanding of you. All right, cool. Let's use the tools that exist now to be the stewards of our own identities, whether we're leading people, finding new jobs, leading a nonprofit, whatever the case. Quick introduction to me so you all understand where I'm coming from. I've been teaching as a professor for about eight years. I teach at the Marshall School at USC. I teach here at Anderson. I teach at Mirage at UC Irvine. I love the practice of teaching. I've never made good money doing it, let me tell you. It's the worst job I ever had financially. But I always allocate 20% of my time to it. It, I, it forces, and let me tell you, I have some graduate students in this room today. I'll tell you, God, they're so good at asking really tough questions. Their laptops are open, the Google search is right there, right there ready to question anything I dare say, right? And our lectures are like four and a half hours. There's lots of time for them to question my content. Point being, this era is kind of a fascinating experience for me because I'm exposed to these students, these great advanced minds working hard with these new communication tools. I get to like watch their careers evolve in these social channels. I also get to travel and give speeches, which is also such a fun experience. I allocate about 20% of my time to that as well, where I go to big conferences, conferences on behalf of corporations, and share uh, branding practices, methodologies in nonprofit branding, whatever the case. What I spend most of my time doing, though, is running a business that I started seven and a half years ago. I believe all of you went to Anderson, are affiliated with this institution, because you will run your own businesses. You will be the leader of an organization. It will be yours to steward. Well, you got to position yourself. You have to brand yourself before you can lead the people, before you can give them someone to believe in. You're going to be the chief believer of the institution you lead. So I worked for lots of other big agencies. I learned all the best things that I could, and then I started my own with my own beliefs. And that's what my team of 25 work against now. We get to serve some of the coolest institutions in the world, from Google to the Catholic Church. We get to help them assess what their audience is thinking, communicate effectively to those audiences so that there can be a deep relationship of trust in the social age. It's a fascinating process, and it's totally available to you now. This is not like a secret science. This is, in fact, I promise, most of what I share with you today, you already know. I'm just reminding you that you know it, and I'm giving you a practice to apply it, all right? So concepts of where I'm coming from, in the early 80s, I was diagnosed with ADD before it was cool. You know, now it's cool to talk about it. Then it was like, dude, you are, get out of our family. Uh, we, can't, get it, we can't tell our friends that you have this. You know, it was a, it was a mark. It was a mark on the family, and I, I uh, thus was treated for it. <laughs> by society, you know, the medications, and I was in special education, I rode the short bus. It was a fascinating, fascinating journey for me. But I'm telling you this because when you think of attention deficit disorder, you think that there is a deficit of attention. No, the truth is, is that it's not a deficit of attention. It's a, there's so much information going on right now in this room that it's hard for us to parse up what's most important. And I'll tell you, I got to study this, like a double-blind crossover study in the principal's office. I went to the principal's office almost every day in high school, and I never cursed in class. I never fought anybody. I just had a little too much energy. That's why it's 8 AM, and I'm like, let's do this. <laughs> in the principal's office, sometimes I was medicated by the nurse. Sometimes I was not. So I literally got to do like a study, you know, walked in a room. Sometimes medicated, sometimes not, right? Well, when I wasn't medicated, I was like, oh my gosh, there is so much information. Look at all the flags on the wall, and there's people coming in. There's like camera operators, and then there's a sound techs up here. You know, each whole, I mean, there's like so many different facets just to this room. You know this. In fact, you know this because if I ask you to close your eyes, 
You could vision, you can envision this space, right? That means you are paying attention to it. But like the people who grew up next to trains, you are practiced at tuning it out. With attention deficit disorder, I couldn't tune it out. That's why it was so vibrant. And not only could I not tune it out, but it wasn't just the environment broadcasting. Every single person, every one of you, is at full broadcast. I mean, look around you. Look at your outfits and your little name tags and your special glasses. And, you know, I mean, each one of you is like a content source. I could write a book just about you right here, right now, in the way that you're sitting there. That's a lot of information, right? Already there's a lot of information. Well, I needed somewhere to channel this, and I found out that at UC Irvine, they were willing to let me in with my ADD disability, that they needed a school mascot. And so I put all of this energy and all of that curiosity into a mascot costume for three years. And I used it as a venue to understand the way that people fought so that I could relate to them. And I'll tell you, I don't know if you've ever interacted with a mascot that follows the rules. They're not allowed to talk. You're not supposed to talk. So I was in that costume four days a week for three years, interacting with police officers and competitors and president, like all of these different people. And it was a fascinating experience because, remember, I had the ADD consciousness being lit up by all of these people in, this, in the environments we were in. And I learned something super fascinating inside that costume, was that every single butt person that I met was looking for the same thing. Because the costume gave them permission, you know, it's just a character, gave them permission to interact with me. They didn't know if I was man or woman, black or white, straight or gay. N they couldn't calculate those things. I didn't talk. Everybody was willing to give me a hug. In fact, everyone asked for a, that was the thing, right? Hug me. And it wasn't like an awkward family hug, you know? <laughs> it was like, you know, I had to like, I had to, I, you know, I had to like hold my lung pattern to be able to endure, you know, the, the basketball players and the police officers and the kids, everyone, right? Well, in that costume, I recognized very quickly, not being able to talk, but with that consciousness that everybody's looking for the same thing, which you already know this. Every song that ever's mattered, whether it's the Beatles or it's a religious song, t tells you that we're all looking for the same thing. We just want to be loved. <laughs> that is absolutely the entirety. I mean, we even went to, to graduate school because we thought we'd be able to make more money and lead more people so that we can give, give ourselves more access to be loved and respected. I mean, it's the pattern in every choice we make. Well, the interesting thing about this is that this is not only not a secret, but businesses know this. Businesses are like, you know, it would be good for business if those consumers loved us. They, you know, buy more of our stuff, hold on to our shares longer if they liked us. So what did business get in the business of doing? Getting you to like them, right? Just funny advertisements and interesting things to distract you. Like me, like me as a business, right? Well, that is not a secret to the political institutions either. Political institutions figured this out a long time ago also. They're like, we could get people to donate more or come out and vote for us if they like us, know what we think and how we feel and get that consistent experience from us over time. So even the political institutions were like, we need a donkey and an elephant and we're going to make them colored. You know, they created all of these content assets to give you something to focus on so that you will like them and thus vote in their favor or donate accordingly. And you don't think the nonprofits figured this out also? They're like, shoot. Shoot, there's lots of other nonprofits out there, and they're all good people. Well, people won't donate to us if they don't know we exist. Well, so that means we got to talk as a nonprofit. But shoot, we do the same thing that everyone else does. Well, nonprofits are talking, aren't they? Aren't they at full blast? And you donate to one nonprofit, they sell your contact information to other nonprofits, and then your mailbox gets filled with white envelopes. I mean, so not only did the businesses and the political parties figure this out, the nonprofits too recognize that if you like them, if you have things to care about them, then you will probably participate. Well, they all learned it from the same source. Religion understood that if you are going to guide the people, you cannot say, here are the 10 rules. That's it, 10 rules. Follow, follow, follow 10 rules. They were like, well, shoot. All right. 
So this is what I want you to know. There were these people in this place, and these special things happened in that place. And then these rules appeared, and those rules were applied, and this was the impact of those rules. You can thus remember the rules, and when I say Ten Commandments, you're not constrained by, shoot, do I remember them? You really think to yourself, I could probably name all of them if I was, if I was patient enough. By design, these organizations recognize that if you like them, can understand them, feel connected to them, you'll forgive them. They can make mistakes like you make mistakes, like I make mistakes. I want you to forgive me for those mistakes. If you like me, you will. It's thus good business, and that is why everyone is talking so loud. I mean, doesn't your Facebook stream feel invaded? Everyone is talking, all the corporations, all the universities. There are universities advertising for MBA programs in Los Angeles where the university has nothing to do with Los Angeles. You know, it's like a Cornell MBA part-time in San Francisco and half-time in LA. Like, all right, well, what is it then? Right. Point in this is that everyone's talking. And the reason why everyone's talking is because they think that it's the way that it used to be. You know, the early days of what was called the wireless, when our president FDR decided that he wanted to make sure that the citizens of his nation heard his voice when he gave the State of the Union address. So he tapped a source called the wireless, at the time the AM radio, we call it, and recognized that if he could relay his voice to 5% of the population, that was far more impactful than any speech he gave to a room where there was a guy transcribing and then he puts it on a horse and it rides off to the ineffective way for him to communicate. Well, all of the organizations, all of the institutions, all the corporations are talking like this is the era. They think that, you know, people just sit around that one device for five hours. Mom and dad and grandma, everybody together. Well, not only do we not know this is the case, but this is what Lego found out is happening in the average living room at 6.30 p.m. in the United States. Yeah, exactly. Oh, to, here, for, I'll give you an example. Um, my graduate students don't take notes any longer. And I know you think that they type into their laptop. And that's not the case either. They just hold up their phone and take pictures. That's the new normal. If you want to take a picture of this nonsense to remind you of something, go for it. It's not going to bother me. This data, this data set was fascinating when I saw it. Average living, you know, at home, uh, there's two parental units, and then there's a kid like this big, and then there's some smaller kids, OK? Two televisions. On same time, different content. You know, nothing related. Yeah, this is your life at home, right? Perfect. Then there's three tablets of varying generations. Some the kids are playing games on, while watching television. Some people are doing sports, right? Then every single person in the family has a mobile device. Even the child, even the four-year-old has, I don't know, mom's old 3GS with a cracked screen, you know? Whatever, <laughs> okay? Two laptops, you know, over here, so like calendaring or like, oh, mess instant messengering with classmates, right? And there's, is there one conversation going on? No, no, no. There's like soccer practice and Bobby's a nerd and then like, should we broker the deal tomorrow? I mean, huh. these are just the devices. This isn't even the content. These are just the devices poking around in your consciousness in this era, this new normal that we're confronted with. Problem, right? Not only problem, but thus, whoever we're speaking to, hiring manager, potential employee, they're not waiting to hear from us. No, their defenses are up, like your defenses are up, right? You skeptical of everything, right? I mean, no, 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 I'm not going to believe you. Well, by design, you did this to yourself because you were tired of the infiltration. Well, as a business, as a parent, as a potential employee, consider the state of affairs. You used to be able to say, this is what it is that I am, company, nonprofit, and people believed you. Everyone believed you. This wasn't that long ago. Not now. It's a whole new default. It's, well, let me inquire. Well, let me hear what my friends or colleagues or other people who've worked with you have said. It's this viral communication network that has changed the nature of what people think and do. The new normal is people used to default to believe in the personal brand that you were, and now they're going to question. They're going to ask questions. Why do they ask questions? Well, it turns out that the brands that they used to believe in, maybe the brands they believed in most, their religions, 
companies their fathers worked for, I don't know, their nation, whatever it was, was built at a different time. A recent time, you remember the Dewey Decimal System, don't you? Yes, friends, we remember the Dewey Decimal System. Recent times, but the problem is, is that social media has just blown open the kimono on these organizations. I mean, everything's bare now. I mean, we know NSA records, university uh, employment policies. I mean, everything is now in the public domain, and it's really shocking to all of us because we shoot, we worship that team. And now its leaders are corrupt, or I believed in that faith, and shoot, now the leaders are corrupt. Oh my gosh, this is creating tension for us. The reason why it's creating tension, and by the way, I'm not saying that they're all bad. I'm not saying that these institutions, corporations, universities, whatever the case are, are all bad. I'm just saying that they were built for the time before now. They were built for, you know, the Dewey Decimal System time. So is this a problem? Is it bad that we are like, well, religion, when you say that, what do you mean specifically? Or what facts or communities can verify this, right? All right. Is this bad that we default to question and that we no longer have these assets to believe in? Well, it turns out scientifically that it is bad. We have been studying this for a very long time. You all have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. All right, here I am, caveman. All right, now I, uh, I need to survive. All right, I need water. For, okay, I've got water. Uh, food, make food, got, got food, great. Shelter, you know, protection, got it, check, check. Mate, reproduce, lineage, okay, great. Good, God. now what? <laughs> Now what? Shit, I need something to believe in. I, I need something to contemplate and talk about and process on, right? I need, I, it's a thing, I need, a, I need something to believe in. It is by our nature. We, we, by design, want something to cherish, something to centralize our energy at. And not only do we want to do this, it manifests itself in so many different ways. There's not only one thing to believe in. You can believe in your son, and the Clippers, right? There's no capacity on belief here. There's not a mutually exclusive space. You can love your team and love the band and love your family and love your religious community all simultaneously, but you recognize that you have this capacity, that all of us have this capacity. In fact, it is a unifying characteristic of human beings. All right. So the question I'm asking you now is, in this new normal, in this time, as a candidate for employment, a potential mate, whatever you are in this moment, the question is, in, who's going to fill this void in this new normal, right? It, we used to be able to just, unadulterated belief, we just believed in the university system. Damn it. Uh, our state government, shoot, <laughs> right? So we're in a state of question. Who's going to fill the belief system void? It's crazy to tell you this. But I really believe that it will be brands. And when I say brand, I don't mean corporations selling shoes. I mean something very specific. I mean an institution much like these, much like your small business, much like your family, much like that big corporation who have made a tactical decision. They're going to do what has always worked in this new normal. These institutions taught us lots of things. They figured out how to keep the audience engaged, caring about, advocating. They figured out how to get the populace to care enough that they attach themselves to things. What they figured out was that if you can find the common topic between you and the audience, the thing that the hiring manager and you both care to talk about, care about. And then you append your belief system to it. How and why and what and for what purpose? Why did I have these jobs? And what did I hope will happen because I did those things? What's those linking elements? This is exactly what these institutions figured out. They were like, all right, the masses, they, they want this god thing or goddesses, whatever. Okay, God thing. All right, perfect. So we as a religion, topic God, yes, great. All our religion is is a belief system. This is how we eat, socialize, build, neighbor, right? All the belief ingredients in the system about the topic of God, much like a political organization might be, right? Topic, you and I, how do we govern the public? How do we take care of our people? Great. Political party, a belief system, 
connected to that topic, okay? For you, consider the audience. Can you bring a topic to the table with that HR hiring manager? Can you bring a topic to the table with your spouse, offspring, in-law, coworker, partner, business partner, competition? Is there a common topic? Well, your default, like the nightly news, is to go after the dark stuff. You know, that's the common denominator. That's the stuff that we're all like, wow, that's terrible, I have to watch it. You know, like KTLA, our local LA television news channel, built an app. Not because this is the new normal and people want it, so that you can watch car chases live on your phone at work. <laughs> That's the common denominator now, right? It's like, well, war and debt and religion and uh, marriage, right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not saying that the topic that you bring to the table is what you both hate most or what disgusts you both. I don't care how common the topic is. You're both not going to be lit up talking about it. You're going to be impacted by the subject's darkness. So in the new normal, the responsibility is to create a common topic that can be celebrated by both parties. By both parties, no matter what their demographic profile. And you will supplement the topic with the belief system. With how and why and because and I hope and we do, right? Like if I asked you to give, tell me what makes Apple's internal identity so special, well, they don't just make hardware and software. I don't think they've ever even said that, right? Even though that's what they do. They were like, no. People who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do. And we hope that they think like we think, that they think different like we think different, and that we will be a partners in this journey of change. OK, great. This is how it comes across in our long-term communications about our business plans or competitors, right? These are the words we use to describe to consumers, that consistent attitude and voice. These are the photographs. I, 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 you know what Apple photographs look like, right? All right, or you know what shapes Apple makes, right? You know, for example, anybody who's ever been in manufacturing will tell you, rounded corners, the biggest waste of material in the manufacturing process. I mean, you lose so much, it requires so much extra tooling that it almost may double the cost of manufacturing an item to round the corners. Well, but it worked. It was enough of a differentiating characteristic and a system of beliefs, how they act, the tone of voice in which they communicate, how they work as teams, how they build products. This is their belief system. And even though their founder, chief believer, no longer exists, oh my gosh. The brand endures. The reputation, productivity, internal motivation endures. Because there was the topic, the common topic of the crazy ones, and the belief system that guided the way that the organization operated in alignment with that concept. So I am suggesting that in the new normal, the personal brands or corporate brands or nonprofit brands that will survive and endure are built for the new normal and the void in the belief ecosystem all that space that those institutions left will be filled by brands that identify that common topic between them and the audience and apply a belief system consistently over time. All right, let's figure out how to do it. So remember, the audience, no matter who they are, your child, your future employer, they're not waiting to hear from you. Remember, the world is already on full blast. We started with this room is already full of information. And that each one of you is a content source in your own right. Well, then we got all the technologies involved, right? It used to be the AM radio, and now we've got devices interrupting even our bathroom time. Yes, it's OK to giggle about that, friends. We all have that awkward shoot. Well, I'm suggesting to you that if you dare talk, if you dare write that resume, cover letter, have that interview, remember that the audience sitting before you is not waiting with open arms to hear your words and hold on to you. You have to create that common topic and communicate what it is that you are and believe and how you act and apply that so that there is no question what it is that you are. So that if by chance I take your call, I read the email you sent 
as a potential employee. I say, fine. Hi. I got gotcha. you. I heard you. Thanks for all the faxes and emails and let. I heard you. Great. What do you want me to know? What do you want me to know? What, are you going to give me a list of things? I'd be like, well, look at all these things that I have done. No. You're going to use some super basic tools that all of you already know. You're just going to apply them to your personal brand identities. Who I am. Why I matter. By the way, you have permission to think this. Your religion or whatever governs your day-to-day -day processing says, know thyself. All right, great, welcome. Welcome to the permission to ask yourself who you are and why you matter. We're going to use business tools, branding business tools, to answer those introspective questions and then communicate them to the audiences we're trying to impact. All right, the first thing that we're going to do is because this is a new time, there are new sources of info. Thank you for catching the joke in that. Nice. The You're welcome to, brother. You're welcome to, please. This is a new time. There are new tools. For example, I haven't met a hiring executive that hasn't Googled the name of a potential employee, excuse me, who own, will not interview a potential employee until they have Googled their name. Like you do when you hear about a new person, right? OK. So because the world is a different place, we don't get to assume who our competition is. We're going to sniff around. How about that you have the right to use social media only as a listening platform? You don't have to say anything. In fact, you can create a fictitious name and identity and join groups and watch the customer. Watch the HR hiring managers talk about their latest hiring practice amidst those groups. You can use social media just as a listening tool. In the new normal, in this era of communication, we don't assume anything about our competition, our comrades, our cohort. We first follow the second rule, which is that whatever the audience is, hiring manager or daughter, donor or chief executive, we're going to empathize. We're going to ask ourselves what it's like to be them. And we're not going to judge it. We're not there to decide whether they're acceptable or not. If they are the audience, if they are the customer, then we must understand what it feels to be them. And it might not be obvious. They might be a different sex. They might be from a different place. It turns out, though, that you have the capacity to understand anyone from any place. I'll ask you, as a takeaway from this conference, Find somebody in your life that is not a child and sit down across from them for 15 minutes and only look them in the eye. No phone, no food, no excuse. Try it. I promise if you pull it off, you'll be crying at the end. That's how innately, organically empathic we are. It is in our programming. Now, we might look at our cats and dogs and emote back and forth because we have permission because they're an animal. But you know you have the operating system. All right, great. Well, whoever the audience is, it doesn't matter how different they are than you. You have the capacity to empathize what it feels like to be them, and you are going to use that as governance for what you dare say. How you talk to them, when you talk to them, why you speak to them. You're going to do them kindness. You aren't going to speak to them out of turn or disrupt their methodologies. In fact, you might advocate for them. And that's what they're going to expect in the new normal, is that if I encounter you, if I hear your voice, not only are you not going to question me, I'm the one doing the questioning. I want to feel like you like what it is that I am. I want to know that you respect what it is that I am, even though I am not you, hiring manager, daughter, chief executive, donor. In fact, I'm willing to advocate for it. If you are my audience, my customer, then I owe it to you. If I'm asking something of you, aren't I obligated? Great. In the new normal, the responsibility for the audience that you are engaging 
you are obligated to advocate for them. If you expect something from them, they must feel that you believe in what it is that they are. Like how hard it is to be an HR manager. How literally how hard it is. Because no matter what size the organization, you've got to find sharpest, smartest, creativest, whatever character. You have to assess their whole professional history. You've got to call people you don't know and decide that you're willing to bring in this liability, this expense for the future of the business. It is hard to be an HR hiring manager. Okay, so don't come in there with, you're going to give me a job, huh? Ask me some questions so we can get this over with so you can give me a job. It wouldn't be fair, right? Great. Next rule in the new normal is that we're going to treat every relationship as a relationship. No more of this, I've never heard of you, big interruption, buy from me now and then see you later. We're not going to take it anymore. We don't do this anymore. Do we, we go by billboards on the freeway all day every day. Are you pulling over and writing down the information? Are you tearing that magazine ad out every single day and taking action on what you've torn? Huh? Not at all. In the new normal, the audience that will support you, advocate for you, hire you, believe in you, wants to feel like there's a relationship at play. And when I say relationship, I don't mean you have to have long-term deep relations. It can simply be, I hear from you regularly. Social media, you know, this is what you're up to. And when I'm up to things, you're there and you hear what it is that I'm doing. You like this when you buy things. You don't buy from a brand that just shows up one time and never turns back. You want a brand that you've heard of, that you've seen, that you can justify, that when you buy, when you go to Anderson, when you put it on your resume, that people will get it. That's why you're here, okay? In the new normal, the obligation of the brand communicating is to communicate as if there is a relationship. Not sell, not close, not broker. Amidst this, you also have a new overwhelming responsibility, which is, my goodness, there is so much information. Every company has these fat websites with all of these lists of things that they do and sell. And who are those lists for? What, for the engineers? So the engineers feel like their job is worth at least being listed on the website? Gosh, doesn't it feel uncomfortable to be in the midst of a website that wasn't built for you, that wasn't curated for you as the customer, curated for you as the daughter, curated for you as the donor? You know, not all the information, the stuff that's specifically relevant to the way that you see, think, emote. I'll give you a real tangible example that you can see on the streets of Los Angeles every day. Mini Cooper, BMW, and Rolls Royce are owned by the same company, the BMW Group. They have a lot of common parts. There are parts in the Mini that are also in the BMWs that are also in the Rolls Royces. Yet they have curated the brands, haven't they? Haven't they kept the lifestyle and relationship of this brand over here? By design, they know that it's good business. Like Coke recognizes that if some of the market won't buy Diet Coke because they don't believe it's masculine enough, that they're going to curate a new product called Coke Zero. Because the audience needed that assistance, apparently. All great nonprofits do this also. They divide up into projects. They have teams that are focused on certain deliverables. You, as a brand, as a business, have a responsibility to curate your content for the audience that you're trying to engage, using their words, their expectations, their understandings, so that they can relate and make the choices that make them bond to you. Curation is derived from art because art is, well, I have this room, and I'm trying to get people to want to come to it and buy the things I put on the wall where there's infinite art and there's infinite real estate. Shoot, I'm going to step up and curate. I'm going to hand select the content that will be most relevant to the audience I'm trying to engage. All right. Sixth part of the new normal as a personal brand is that if, it, if this is what you are, if your personal brand is what you are, then I promise you, you have to teach it. What I mean in this respect is you don't get to just practice it as an employee. You don't get to just do it 
as a good father, you are obligated in the new normal to practice it by teaching other people also. Once a year, sitting down in a father workshop and helping them understand the tricks of the trades that you learned as a father. Or as a brand strategist, as a business owner, we allocate 10% of our time to nonprofits so that we're constantly teaching these nonprofits how to effectively communicate in this new normal. There is no opportunity to sell in the new normal because the audience is a state of defense. But they will listen if you teach them. They will listen if they feel like they can gain something from it. And if you don't believe me, walk into a Tesla dealer dealership. There's no selling going on, honey. There is no selling at the Tesla dealership. All there is is education. That's why if you hang out with a Tesla owner and ask them, dare ask them about their car, you will need to pull up a chair because it will be a 30-minute course. And that's what they pride themselves on, right? That they have learned about this revolution and they understand the systems because they were taught, not sold to. So like I said with the nonprofit action, the days of I have some extra money, I'm a corporation, I've got some extra money, and I'm going to donate it, you know, to this walk over here. Or I as an individual have made just a little extra money, so I'm going to give it away to a nonprofit. You know, I'm just going to let them deal with the responsibility. It's not going to work in the new normal. The only thing that's going to matter is what you do with your time. What it is that you are. How you pass your time will be the evidence of your giving. Because your time is far more valuable than whatever dollar currency, whatever unit of transaction you are giving to that nonprofit. The time you've spent with the action is what people will gauge you on. That will be the definition. That will be who you are and why you matter in the actions about caring for others. We don't want to hear about how much money you gave away. We can't relate. We make more money. We make less money. We come from different places. But you mean to tell me that you spend 10% of your time every day? Every day. Nonprofit gets full value services, you law firm? Really? God, that's admirable. Isn't the services you sell as a law firm the most expensive thing that you could possibly do? And you give that away? Plumber? That's awesome, plumber. That's awesome, personal coach. Great job. I will tell you as a professor of eight years that I have learned more in the classroom than I have ever learned on the battlefield of business. The students ask the questions that the business people do not have the chutzpah to ask. It is the greatest learning platform and as all of the great teachers have ever said, when you teach it, you're learning it a second time, fifth time, hundredth time, making you truly a master. Cool. Last piece. You got to talk about it though. Who you are and why you matter cannot stay inside. I won't be able to relate to you as a friend. I want to know what you believe in. I want to know what you think and care about. And we all think and care about different things, so we have the permission to do that. None of us sees any topic the same way. So let's get over agreeing on it. So it's a scary time, though, what I would call the wild, wild west in social media. There are no sheriffs. There are no kings or queens. Is there a company that does it best? Is there like a famous person who's doing it best? I don't know. There's these ebbs and flows. I can't see the return, but what I do know is this. I was on a speaking tour in Central America, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, South Mexico, Panama. And my policy as an American is that when I land in foreign place, that I do not sit in fancy hotel. I put on some punk band t-shirt and Converse, and then I just walk for as many hours as possible, often at least four, in a single direction. I ended up at a fish market in Panama. I don't eat lobster, and I definitely don't speak Spanish. Definitely not. In fact, an alumni of this program, a dear friend of mine, Curtis Kaiser right there, joined me on, these, on this amazing trip as a business partner in the speaking tour. It was a very big tour, and he was my translator. We stood before this man who started a conversation in Spanish, which I didn't understand, and he ended up communicating that we have the, he has a dinghy, a boat, that has cages, and he throws those cages over the side, then he catches the lobsters, and then he brings them to this fish market. And then, bam, he hands me his Twitter and Facebook handles. And I'm like, Curtis, ask him why, why did he, what does he do this, with this Twitter thing? And the guy says, well, how else am I supposed to tell people about my latest catch? so that they can plan their restaurant menus or put a meal together for their family. Is there a faster, better method you know? I'm like, holy shit, no. 
And then I was like, well, what about the Facebook? And he's like, well, what about your, how, you see your family at what, Christmas, Hanukkah? Is that enough for you? Is that enough family time? Don't you want to know what the kids are up to weekly? Well, what else, you don't use Facebook for this? When Curtis and I were on this tour, I didn't matter if it was a taxi driver or concierge, I asked all of them. I was like, what social media? What do, you, what do you do with it? Let me tell you, friends, we as Americans, we are so far behind. We are such a distant ninth at this whole idea of modern communication that we're cocky enough to say some of us are like, well, we don't do it. That, that Facebook thing we do not do. I don't care about corporation Facebook. I don't care about corporation Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, nothing of those things. I care about the communication platform. I care about how the world now communicates, like you will not go back to the Dewey Decimal System, like you will not go back to map and compass. You use internet search. GPS on your phone, right? You're not going to go back to the old way. OK, cool. In the new normal, we're not going to go back to the old way. We're going to use these modern communication tools. No matter what company is leading the channel, they will be the way we engage. So my god, is it scary. Arguably, social media may be the most powerful weapon in history. And I say it like this. We used to say that the pen is mightier than the sword. No matter how much brawn, Nothing could impact the world more than strong words and the right voice. Well, the click is mightier than the bomb. Fine. Same concept. That's why we have 10 civil wars going on in the Middle East. The US military, most powerful military force in the history of military forces, could not disrupt those 10 governments. And here we have Algeria, Tunisia, Sudan, Bahrain, all in the midst of introspective civil wars because we gave the masses the power to communicate. Do you think they will let us take it from them? No. So this is the way that it is now, isn't it? All right. Well, welcome. Welcome to the new normal. And aren't we lucky to live in this time? That our words, our tweets, our teachings may turn out to be just as powerful as those corporations and their ideas. Your Twitter post has just as much likely to go around the world and be socialized and to ignite like a post from Barack Obama or Microsoft. So just breathe into this for a second. The time before now, these political brands and business brands knew that if you loved them, if you liked them, then you would pay more attention. You'd pay them more money. You'd care about them more deeply. So they all got into the business of talking. Well, then all this technology showed up, and social media showed up, and exacerbated the insanity of their voices. But what also came with this communication channel was a leveling. A leveling. Where we all have equal power now. We're all on the same playing in the same game. So if we're going to talk, if we're going to try to convince an audience of something, if we're going to get our family to believe in us as the leader, if we're going to get our coworkers to believe in the direction we're going to pursue, if we're going to get the donors to stand up and act and volunteer and participate, if we're going to get the hiring manager to convince themselves that you deserve to meet other people in the business, we're going to recognize that this is a new time. And thus, we're going to communicate with the most powerful weapons in the history of communication. We're going to use our introspective journey about our personal self, who we are and why we matter, and we're going to put a stake in the ground. And you can pull out the stake and move it, but you're going to put a stake in the ground. You can edit it every day if you want. If I asked you, when was the last time Amazon updated their website, none of you would be right because they update it all the time, every day. Great. Welcome. Welcome to the new normal. The resume you wrote yesterday huh, doesn't necessarily reflect what it is that you are right now. You've learned new things. You've tried new services. You've served more nonprofits. You have evolved as a being. But in the new normal, you must put a stake in the ground, at least for the moment, so that when I pick up your breadcrumbs, when I search for you, and when I find you, 
Who you are and why you matter is not left to question. It is abundantly clear to me who you are and why you matter and who else believes it and how they advocate for it because there's evidence. And if you don't believe me that there's evidence, type your name into Google. Things will show up that you did not put there. Well, you're going to leave that file empty? Huh? Are you going to leave that file empty? You didn't, have, you didn't choose for it to be there. But it is there, and it has your identity attached to it. Are you going to leave what is in it to chance? Or are you going to put stuff in the file? Huh? I, we, as your believers, want you to put stuff in the file. Because we can relate to you then. Like if you want to do business in Japan, you do not get to show up with your fancy American briefcase, stick out your hand, and say, let's sign. You have to party for 24 hours with that senior business executive. You got to go do karaoke and drink sake and stand up on stage and be your true self before that chief executive in Japan will dare do business with you. All right. In the new normal, you want to rent an Airbnb. You know, these people are renting out their condos or homes to temporary stays. I've done it all over the world. It's a really fun experience. You cannot rent a unit without a social media profile so I can validate who you say you are if you're going to stay in my house. Do you have friends? What do they do? Where do they live? I want to know these things if you're going to stay in my backyard. All right, it's the new social currency, right? Your identity, who you are and why you matter, and that it is public, and you defend it. These are the responsibilities of personal brands in the new normal. And I'm so honored to share it with you. Let's stick around. We've got 10 minutes. Are there any questions? No. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy, yes. do we have time for questions? What do we, we got? time for questions. I want to thank you for starting off our alumni weekend conference on great footing here. I think we're all going to go back and look at our businesses, our business schools, our personal brands. And uh, I think there's going to be people Googling themselves and making sure they're filling that void. So thank you very much for starting. You're so welcome. Out. Thank you so much for saying that, Kev. I get a bag of swag? You get swag. Thank Yay. you. Yay. <laughs> so any questions? Please. Hi, Colette. Class of 87. We have, we have mics here. If you can come, it'll get on, it'll get on camera. Nice. <laughs> Hi, Colette Moore, class of 87. Look at this personal brand, dear friends. Look at this self-expression, right? Professional, OK? Self-confidence, right? It's ready? We can't wait to hear you, honey. We did. Uh, Na uh, National Association of Women Business Owners, amazing conference. If you are a woman and a business owner, please join forces with other women business owners. So I often wonder about what is too much. Good. And that's a, something you cover, you know, how often does Amazon update? But right. Maybe there is a reluctancy in, in the U.S., you know, how much is too much? Good. Especially for people that are still getting into, and I do quite a bit of social media, but I often wonder, is it Good. Bad? I'll repeat. Great question, great question. How much is too much in this new normal of talking? I don't know, but guess what? We can research the answer. We can find five other people like us, maybe the same industry, or serving the same community, and we can f listen to them and be a consumer. Oh my gosh. What does it feel like when they post every day? Do I feel like I want more, or is that too much? And what do they say when they post? Are they teaching us, or are they saying, discount, buy from us, new product? You will create definitions. You will set the parameters for you and your sector for whatever challenge is before you by simply using two ears. We have two ears and only one mouth. We should be listening twice as much as we talk. Same in social media, OK? You have permission to participate in social media as a listener. What a great data set. The freshest, most powerful data set anyone has ever had in the history of humanity. Thank you, Colette, for that question. Yes, hi. And just, this will be our last question. I'm getting the uh, uh -oh. response that it's quick break before the next I want the cane. I want, could we get, remember that from the card? Yeah, no. Hi. 
Hi, uh, Keith McWilliams from class of 89. Um, I wanted you to kind of expound a little bit on someone from a personal service business, accountants, lawyers, investment Great. advisors, things like that. Great. Um, LinkedIn's the first thing that comes to mind, but how, how, what tools do we have, to, since we're not a product, to put something out there? And then can you sort of fold in the line between your personal profile and the LinkedIn, Facebook world versus putting out a different package of you Great. in the professional world? All right, so your second question is uh, dividing the line. Where's my personal voice and my professional voice? In capturing that, I forgot this, the first part of the question, which was... Um, Professional services. Oh, yeah, professional services. Okay, so this was the mark in my mind, which is um, professional services. So I sell my lawyering advice, or I sell my tax advice, or I sell my branding advice, right? Uh, professional service. There's this misperception that there isn't a place to be branded. And when I say to be branded, I mean to be clear and consistent and to hold a position and employ that in what you say and do. Okay, so in business to business, Corporation buying services from another corporation, we have this misperception that it is building corporation, doing business with building corporation, and that is not the case, right? There's human inside building, doing work, handshake with human inside building. So even in the business to business universe, the brand matters. It's how I relate, understand, come to respect, and therefore be able to advocate for what you're saying and doing. So I believe in the professional services market because all it is now is a war of words. We have the best CPA services. Our CPA services are better than, they're faster, smarter, sharper. Who's going to quantify these assertions, right? Well, it's not about being the loudest in that action. In the business to business world, it's who's the decision maker? Who has the power to sign? Can we empathize with who they are? Can we advocate for them and their responsibilities? Can we build a multi-touch point relationship? Right? See the homework? Perfect. That's the answer to the service question. If you're in the service business, you have the same obligation to position your brand. Now the second question is, how do you deal with personal versus professional identities on the web? Like I joked earlier, it's the new normal, and not only the new normal, it's the wild, wild west in the new normal. So there isn't a perfect example of what you asked. I'll tell you what my chief executive clients do. They have a personal Twitter, and they have a professional Twitter. They have a personal Instagram, and they have a professional Instagram. They don't cross-promote. They keep them insulated. And on the personal accounts, they only accept people. In the business account, they'll let anyone follow them, hear their teachings, see the pictures in the, in the conferences. Anyone can follow. But the personal stuff, I'm on vacation. This is really fun. They only accept followers. It's really artistic. And it's working super, super well because they're self-expressing more. And that's what we need. We were misled. We were told that if you fit in this box, all will come before you and you will succeed. And we have all learned that that was the exact wrong direction. They didn't know what was best for us. Here we have the tools to ask and take action. And it's kind of an amazing time. All right, guys. Have a great conference. Thank you for the time.